And um, he didn't want me to walk the, up the grade from the gate to the chapel. And he told me just to please not go. Give your lungs a little rest. <clears throat> and please excuse my voice. I got a frog in my throat. <coughs> and uh, it just won't jump out. <clears throat> but while he was while he was telling me that I couldn't go into the prison and just <clears throat> take a rest, don't do anything where you have to walk anything more than on the level. <clears throat> Peggy's desire was to <clears throat> go to Alaska one more time. And so we thought, well, I can't go to prison. So we'll get on a boat and go to Alaska. And we did. <clears throat> and uh, we had gone all the way to Skagway. <clears throat> We'd gone to Juneau and um, 
I can't remember all the places we went now, but anyway, we we were enjoying our our boat ride and everything was level and the only kind of time you had to go up, you got on an elevator and went up in the boat. So I was on level ground. <clears throat> Coming back and we were just one one stop short of Seattle where we were to get off the boat and come back to Leesburg. When we were sitting there watching two violin ladies play, playing the violin, very beautiful. <clears throat> and I asked Peggy, would you like a cappuccino? She said, uh, no, not right now. And so just sat there and listened to them. And I looked at my watch and it was five minutes after one and we hadn't eaten anything yet. I said, it's late, let's go up to uh, deck 16 and get us a bite to eat. Would you like to go eat? And she just looked at me and smiled. She couldn't talk. I said, come on, we're going to the room. And I got up to get her up. She couldn't walk. So we get, got her <clears throat> in a wheelchair and got her down to a medic. Down there she had a seizure. And um, that we thought she was going to die right there. <clears throat> and anyway, we had about, <clears throat> thank you. We had about 200 uh, miles to go to get off of the boat. And uh, so they stopped in Victoria, Canada. <clears throat> we got off the boat, got her to the hospital, Victoria. <clears throat> got her into the ICU. And she stayed at the ICU for eight days. Then on the third day, or actually I, I stayed with her in, in the room the whole time. <clears throat> Even though they got me a hotel room uh, at $800 or at, at $200 a night, I, uh, I only went there twice to shower. The rest of the time I stayed in the room with her. Then on Wednesday about two o'clock in the morning, she went into cardiac arrest. And we had two doctors and three nurses working with her. Just, and I wasn't even sure what was going on. I didn't know it at the time what was happening. <clears throat> and so they <clears throat> got her stable and she's uh, improved somewhat. So Saturday, we got on a medevac plane, a Lear 19, and we attempted to fly back to Leesburg, Florida for $51,000. They're not cheap. <laughs> and uh, so we got, <clears throat> we stopped at Denver to change pilots and I guess refuel. And then we started to come on home and we were at 40,000 feet and there was a thunderstorm that went all the way from the Gulf all the way to Michigan. We did our best to get over that. And we went up to 42,000 feet, but the, it was so crazy. We were looking out the window and the lightning, you could see down below us and you could see lightning above us. <clears throat> so they had to, they had to land in Dallas because we couldn't get over the storm. So we spent the night in the hospital in the ICU, Dallas. Next day we came home, went into the ICU in Leesburg, and uh, we were there for three weeks. So we had quite a vacation, yeah. <laughs> whatever you call it. And um, <clears throat> we did, uh, we had already made arrangements for her to see a, a Dr. Sampong, 
And uh, so he came into the hospital and he told her, I said, now you're gonna have to wear a vest, a life vest. I had never heard of it with a life vest. But you're gonna have to wear a life vest for probably about three months. And uh, so that's what that box is on the side, controls that vest she has on the back. There's two pads for heart skips a beat or for heart stops that will actually shock her to get her heart to start moving again. But on there is two buttons. And if it, if it just skips a beat, she has to push those two buttons. She doesn't have strength enough to do that. So I've got to be with her 24 seven. And, uh, and that's okay. Yeah. She's my wife, I love her. And, Amen. but uh, she's not been out of my sight uh, for almost three months now. Praise the Lord. Amen. And uh, we're, God's given us the ability, God's given us the grace uh, to get us through all of this. And um, it's not been easy. We've had a lot of prayer. A lot of people have prayed for us. Uh, I've contacted, uh, well, I've been in contact with this church uh, through, uh, <clears throat> through Red and Ralph, and uh, other churches have been praying for us. And so uh, we made it through. Amen. But this morning, every day, uh, she has to take about eight pills. And just for giggles and grins this morning, I don't know why I didn't do this before, but I had uh, I had ordered her pills. To, I got to pick them up Tuesday because these pills they don't keep on hand all the time. And uh, in escrow, you see it advertised on TV. It's a it's a brand new heart medication. Uh, so she's on that. She's on Berlinta. In Carved Dip, Carved Can you spell it? Car okay. Uh, that one's not too expensive. That's only $36 for a bottle of that. But the, <clears throat> the Ernestro is $682. Berlenta's $415 and some change. And so when she was taking her meds this morning, I'm thinking, hmm, you know, every time she takes her meds, she swallows. Thirty-six dollars, <laughs> uh, but anyway, hey, God's taking care of us. God's been good to us, and uh, He's got us um, so close together. Uh, she found out that she really needs me. <laughs> No, hey, listen, uh, God always has, you know, we don't know, talking with Brother Paul this morning, we don't know what we can do until we have to go through it, and God gives us grace yeah. to, to get us through what we need to get through, and uh, God has been so good to us, and um, so... We just appreciate so much your prayers, uh, Al, that uh, God has just blessed us abundantly. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of First Kings. I'm going to just speak a little bit on a story that you've heard before, and if you hadn't heard it, uh, it it's a... <clears throat> it's a story that God puts us in the Word of God and that we think we just can't make it. We think sometimes that just it's not fair. But yet <clears throat> God gives us this information in the Word of God that would help us to understand God's goodness, God's power, God's love uh, for us. So in 1 Kings chapter 17, 
And let's start reading, let's start reading with verse 8. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he rose up and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise, and behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me therefore a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according and sang of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days, and the barrel of oil wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for giving us words that strengthens our faith. Thank you for giving us words that strengthens our resolve, that we might know that there's a God in heaven that loves us and cares for us. And even when our faith grows weak, even Lord, when we see that there's no way and we don't know what to do and how to do, Lord, you're still there. And you give us all that we need in your word. You encourage our hearts. Thank you for the word of God today. On your word as we try to bring a little message to these people that, Lord, their hearts might be encouraged. Lord, our prayer is always, if there be one under the sound of our voice, that maybe they're struggling today, they need a little encouragement. Or maybe there's one here today that's never trusted your Savior. Lord, that they might be saved before it's everlasting too late. Amen. Lord, that's what it's all about. Forgive us for we failed you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the ministry of Elijah was a strange ministry to say the least. First of all, the fact that he was born obviously about 900 years before Christ. He lived in a little town called Tishbe, which was in Gilead, and it was in the north portion. 
and we don't know anything about him, all of a sudden he appears in the Word of God. We've not heard anything before him. But he appears, and as he comes into the Word of God, if you look back just a few verses before what I read, he walks into Ahab's court and gives him the latest weather report. Yeah. He said, it's not going to rain for three years. And we don't really understand why God did what he did. But of course, if you talk, know a little bit about Ahab, he married Jezebel. And Jezebel brought the, the worship of Baal onto the scene. But here's Elijah. He was sent by a brook to wait out the drop. The brook dries up. And what's he gonna do? Elijah, we don't know a lot about him, obviously. But God is taking care of him. Even though the brook dries up, there's no more water, no more rain. And so he's sending him, not to a place that has plenty. God is sending him to a place that is very poverty stricken. You know, when we think about what we, when things dry up, we want to go where there's plenty, but God sent him to a place where this woman didn't have anything. In fact, by her testimony that she was going to make, she was going to make this, uh, this cake, and uh, they were going to eat it and die, and she was prepared to do that. But that's not the end of the story. You see, in Romans 11, verse 23, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Amen. When you get down to the bottom of your barrel, when you get down to where you don't know which way is up. When you get to the place where you call the president of Rock of Ages and you say, sir, I don't know what I'm going to go to prison again. I don't know what my ministry is going to be anymore. I am willing to turn in my resignation. Not that I want to quit, but it's not fair that I can't go to prison right now. My heart's there. My desire is to be there. But I can't go right now. What should I do? He says, you're not going to resign. You're not going to quit. We're not going to accept it. God has a thing for you to do. Amen. 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 And I said, and I'm willing to do it, but I don't want to be a freeloader. And so here's, here's Elijah. He doesn't have anything to eat. He knows he has a ministry. But he really doesn't know what's going on. All he can do is follow what the Lord tells him to do. Yeah. <clears throat> now when you look at the widow, she didn't have anything. 
but she was willing to provide a glass of water. But she thought that she didn't have the means to provide a cake because she only had a little bit of flour left, a little bit of oil, and she was going to make that for her and her son, and they were going to die. As far as she was concerned, she couldn't do anything for Elijah except to give him a glass of water. She had no prospect. She had no hope. But Elijah said, wait a minute. He said, feed me first. Wow. Feed me first. Seems like a total act of compassion to me. Mm-hmm. But anyway, he said, feed me first. And he said, by the way, if you feed me first, God's going to take care of your barrel, your barrel, and God's going to take care of your oil. And regardless of what what you do, God's going to keep them full if you take care of the Lord's man first. Hmm. You know the modern philosophy is that man must have his needs met before he can take care of anything else. That's the way we think. Well, if God takes care of me, I'll take care of I'll take care of everything else. You see, but that's not God's way. What it was here was if you do what the Word of God says, if you do what the man of God says, God's gonna take care of you and God's gonna take care of him. Now there's five things real quick. And I know what time it is. But there's five things real quick I want you to see. First of all, a hard request. You know, he said, hey, take care of me first. Sometimes God asks. Sometimes God asks us to do things that we think are absolutely impossible. We no doubt need in our heart and we we go to missions conferences and we we hear the pastor preach and <clears throat> excuse me and we hear all these things and we think that sounds good but he doesn't know my life. I was in a missions conference one time. We were challenged. We were challenged to double our faith promise missions giving. Now I was in college and going to school. school here, uh, I was twelve hours a day, seven days a week at the new new shipyard in Virginia, carrying sixteen credits. And this missionary come and he's preaching on faith promise missions giving and he says we want you to double your faith promise. I can't do that. Now my faith promise missions giving wasn't much at that time. I, was, I think I was giving I think I was giving 25 hours to faith promise. But fifty dollars was just no way. But you know, he gave an illustration that blew my mind away. He talked about now. This is back. Let's go back to the sixties, okay? <clears throat> A truck driver was driving from Maine to Florida. 
And when they would drive from Maine to Florida, <clears throat> they would try to stop someplace. Well, this guy that <clears throat> was in the service, he owned a motel. This same missionary uh, told them to double your faith promise giving. He said, I got a motel. He said, I've got so many rooms. I've got so many employees. That's all I can do. But he said, at God's command, I will double my faith promise giving. <clears throat> the trucking company the next week called that motel and he said my drivers drive all the way from New England down to Florida he said your place is about halfway he said could we have drivers spend the time their, uh, their day sleeping in your motel now motels mostly have people sleep at night. But these drivers were going to be driving down and, and not sleeping at night, but sleeping during the day. And get up and go on. So as he doubled his, his as he doubled his faith promise giving to the Lord, God more than doubled his income by these truck drivers stopping there. You see, God works in mysterious ways. We don't know what God's going to do if we will just say, yes, Lord, I will do. And so we see a hard request. He said, give me a cake first. We see an honest response. The woman, the woman told the truth. In her mind, as far as she was concerned, from a human standpoint, she could not do what the man of God asked her to do. But you see, from God's vantage point, it was totally different. You see, we don't... Someone explained to me one time... <clears throat> God's up here. This is the beginning of the world. This is the beginning of time. This is the ending of time. We're in this little bit right here. You see, God sees the beginning of time and God sees the end of time, but we only see just this little part where we live. He sees the whole thing. And so... Even though she said, I've done all, I'm, I'm doing all I can. But from where God's standpoint was, he could see that there was going to be plenty of meal. Most of God's people served most of their time with an empty barrel. We don't realize that God, God can put in there all that we need. Philippians 4 verse 19 says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. God will supply all our need. We don't have to worry about we don't have to worry. If God says for us to do something, God will supply that need. Now there's a fine line between faith and foolishness. I understand that. But when God tells us something, and, and <clears throat> you know as well as I know, you're sitting in the pew and the preacher's preaching or you hear something on TV or something comes across your heart and your mind, you know if God's really speaking to you or not. 
So we have a heart request. We have an honest response. We look at verse 13. Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me there uh, thereof a little cake first, and bring it to me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Heavenly requirements. Heart request, honest response. God required that she trust him. Simple trust. She knew what was coming before Elijah arrived. Look at verse 9. Arise, get the Zarephath, which belonged to Zidon, and dwell there. Now watch this. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So God had already talked to her. God had already spoken to her heart. God's requirement is the same for us. Faith. Faith has to be the guiding force. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Can you take this Bible and prove that it's true? You can give evidence. You can show a lot of evidence. But you can't prove. You see, it's faith. We have a faith ministry. By faith, we trust in God. By faith, we believe. By faith, we do what we do in the Word of God. By faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. You see, it's a faith ministry. By faith. So the heavenly requirements. You see, when we when we work, when we work with God from the lack of our ability, then we can't brag, right? If we know that we can't do anything, yeah. we know that we're empty, then we can't, we can't brag on ourselves. We have to brag. God has supplied our need yeah. according to his riches in glory. Amen. Yeah. Verse 15, quickly. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat how many days? Many days. Many days. <clears throat> By faith. By faith this woman served God. And God blessed her. Back over to the book of I believe it's the book of Luke. Jesus is watching them as they as they put their money in the treasury. Little little widow woman comes up. She puts in her two mites. Jesus said she has given more than all of these because she's given all that she has. They're given of what they're able to give. They're given and bragging about what they're able to do. But this poor lady, all she had is what she gave. You see, 
James 4 verse 10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. He's able to lift us up. He's able to give what we can't give. He's able to do what we don't do and can't do. <clears throat> the last part of verse 15 and verse 16. And he and her house did eat many, uh, many days. Verse 16. You want to shout. And the barrel of meal wasted not. Neither did the cruise of oil fail. Yeah. Now watch. Why? According to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Right. It wasn't some mysterious thing. You see, it was a happy reward. The three of them, Elijah, the woman and her son ate well the whole way through all of this famine. I don't know what others did, but we know that these three ate well. Why? Because she believed God and was accounted unto her for righteousness. Amen. You see, <clears throat> serving God. Serving God from an empty barrel is so much more enjoyable than serving God from what we have. When we realize what we're doing, what we're doing for the Lord is because we're doing it because the Lord provides us. It's not what I can do. It's what the Lord has allowed me to do. You see, the whole idea of this story, the whole idea, just serve the Lord. Keep serving. Yes. Even though it might be serving out of an empty barrel. Because God will keep giving if we keep serving. But we have to be willing. We have to be willing to give. We have to be willing to let God work through us. God will work through anybody that will let him work through them. He's not going to knock you down in all probability. Grab you by the and say, you've got to serve me. He doesn't want that kind of person. God wants those that are willing. They have a love for God. They have a love for what God's doing. They have a love for God's people. And they're willing that if God will allow me if God will allow me to do, I will do all that God allows me to do. That's what it's about. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Every ear bowed, every eye closed. Perhaps you're, you're here with all of this that's going on in the world today. Gas prices out of sight. No food on the shelves in the grocery stores. No formula for your baby. Walmart can't even, doesn't even make their projected sales. 
some of you, some of you are living, most of you probably are living on a fixed income. You don't have any more money coming in. You have no way of getting any more money. But your government doesn't care. But God cares. And God, can, and God says t to you and to me, it doesn't make a difference how much food costs. It doesn't make a difference how much gasoline is. It doesn't make any difference how much our mortgage or rent is. If you trust me, I'll make you to where you're able to meet all those obligations. But you've got to trust me. You can't do it on your own. You can go in the corner and cry. You can go to the bank and borrow money. You can do whatever you might do. But God is willing and God is able to supply your need <clears throat> through all of what's going on. Brother, speak to the hearts of these people. Lord, you know their need. You're the one that put this message on my heart for this people. And Lord, we pray for them. And I'm sure that there are some here right now today that they're wondering how they're going to make it. But Lord, just as you supplied to the widow woman, Lord, just as you supplied the, the meal and the oil, Lord, help us to put God first in our lives. Lord, we pray for these people. Thank you again for the word of God. Thank you for all that you do for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> we're going to sing a verse of invitation.